Hello, puppies and kittens. Very excited today to have a guest on that I've been trying to get on for a few years. But of course, as most of her appearances are on television, uh, it's um, I, I, it, it's difficult to, to coax somebody into a lowly podcast. So I'm, I'm <laughs> very pleased to have on a professor of biblical, of, excuse me, of Hebrew Bible and ancient religion at the University of Exeter, Professor St uh, Francesca Stavrakopoulou. Welcome Hi. aboard. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. All right, so we've got a number of questions for you uh, about, you know, where did this whole Bible thing come from? I have to tell you that here in the United States, there's a whole lot of people that think that the that, that Moses wrote the Bible uh, and that everything in the Bible is, is a literal historical account, except where it's metaphorical and where it's metaphorical often changes depending on who you're talking to, so that a believer will tell you, will tell me that something is only metaphorical, but will tell the next person that it was literal again. And we see that kind of flip-flopping quite a bit. I've often heard from people that the book of Genesis, or the, excuse me, the first three chapters of the book of Genesis are the oldest book ever written. And so we're going to be talking about uh, a little bit of that. I really want to know where these came, things came from. And my first question is my name, Aaron Ra, um, which is my legal name now, because uh, somehow that's how everybody came to know me. And so it just made sense to change the name. Uh, I needed to choose a screen name back in uh, my Usenet days, a uh, like quarter of a century ago now. And I chose the, the name, uh, my, name, my name was already Aaron, but I chose Aaron Ra because I wanted to give a nod to Amen Ra, who yeah. I saw as a template for the God of Western monotheism. I had read somewhere a long time ago that uh, that both characters were at one point anthropomorphized. They were both seen as, you know, have, walking around and, and talking and sitting and eating and everything like, like the Old Testament still says. And that both of these characters, before they became full-on elementals, uh, they, they both had human bodies and they both had wives. And in fact, the same wife, whether she was called Athera or Asheret or whatever. But I've never seen the evidence of this. I've only heard the claim. So can you give me a, an idea where this Yahovah character came from. <laughs> and yeah, the fact is, and to be perfectly honest, we don't really know. In, in other words, we don't really know at what point this God Yahweh um, began to emerge. We don't know whether he started off um, as an epithet of a different deity, maybe the deity Ale, who was your bog standard Southern Levantine, not just Southern Levantine, Levantine high God, um, so the high god at the top of the polytheistic system, beneath him, a range of kind of other, a second generation group of deities, the frontline deities, each with their own portfolio of responsibilities in the cosmos, whether storms or seas or sex or death or whatever. So some scholars say that perhaps Yahweh started off as an epithet, a title um, of the high god Ale. Others say that he started off as a different kind of deity, as a minor storm deity, probably somewhere from the region of what the Bible know, knows as Edom, um, so basically southern Jordan. I tend to lean towards that latter theory. I think he starts off as a minor storm deity of the wilderness, um, but gradually is prioritised um, politically and religiously and socially by those people that we know as the ancient Israelites and Judahites. So a late Bronze Age minor deity who by about the ninth century BCE, so by early Iron Age, is pretty well established as the patron deity of these political groupings um, known as the Kingdom of Israel and the Kingdom of Judah. So that's the kind of short answer. And yeah, he had a missus, he had a wife, the goddess Asherah. And was that the same wife as Amen Rahed or Amen? It's so difficult to know. I mean, in terms of, of particularly Egyptian origin deities, um, there are so many similarities across ancient Southwest Asia in terms of different gods and goddesses. Um, I think we need to be careful about mapping too directly one particular god profile onto another god profile, particularly in the Southern Levantine region in the late Bronze and early Iron Ages. There was a lot of Egyptian influence culturally and visually as well as politically in the Southern Levant. Um, but I don't know about the extent to which if you were to ask some dude in ancient Jerusalem, hey, you know, your goddess Asherah, 
isn't she just like the goddess Isis in Egypt? He would probably say, absolutely not. No, not at all. And so I think, you know, as scholars, we need to be a bit careful about making direct comparisons as well. But I think there are similarities between certain types of deity in the ancient world. Um, but Asherah seems to have been the wife of Yahweh, seems to have been much more of a type of a traditional Levantine goddess um, rather than a particularly Egyptian style goddess. I just wish that I could get people to understand that at this time, I mean, if you if you take a class on archaeology, I mean, if you do nothing more than take a class on archaeology, you're going to get a completely different perspective. If you talk to an archaeologist anywhere in the world that specializes on any on any place and time, you're going to realize that biblical literalism is just not supported by anything anywhere. You don't even have to get into paleontology. Archaeology is enough. I would like for people to understand that, you know, at any given moment in what they consider to be biblical history, that there are people worshiping entirely different religions and pantheons of different gods all over the world. And so that things aren't the way they make it out to be. I mean, I've talked to people who think that Christianity is the world's oldest religion, that it's the first religion and that somehow Judaism comes from Christianity. No, <laughs> I mean, I, I do have, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I mean, that, that's a crazy thing, because even if, you know, even when we're talking about the biblical periods, so say the Iron Age, um, when the beginnings of these biblical texts, they start to, they, they're starting to take shape from, some scholars say as early as the 8th century BCE, so like, say, like, books like the books of Hosea, maybe the book of Amos, maybe bits of Isaiah, but most of this kind of intensive literary activity really kicks off in the 5th century BCE. But even at this period, say in the 8th century BCE, there were different kinds of Yahweh. So Yahweh of Samaria, a city in the northern kingdom of Israel, seems to be differentiated from Yahweh of the south, Yahweh of Taman, seems to be differentiated from Yahweh of Jerusalem. So we have inscriptions referring to these different types of Yahweh. And the chances are they weren't necessarily seen as the same deity. Maybe they were seen as local manifestations of, of this particular God, but maybe they were seen as slightly distinct deities altogether. So even God himself um, isn't necessarily the same thing at the same time in different places and to different urban communities, living only, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles apart. So it's, it is important to emphasise that just that diversity of religious practice is what clearly comes through in archaeology as opposed to the sameness of theological belief. Belief is different from practice. I got to read, read this. So, uh, let me learn how to speak again. I have to read a few uh, super chats that came on very early. Uh, Zagros Ozkan gave $19.99. Happy to support. No need to thank. Well, too bad. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Woody also offers a one pound of 99 super sticker. I'm not sure what the, why choose one pound 99. I feel almost feels like there's a, there's a message in there somewhere. And I think there's another one. If I scroll down, I thought, yep, yep. We've got, oh, where to go? Here he goes. All right. So Kayla Grant gave $5. Thank you for your content. You helped me a lot with my deconversion. Very happy to hear that. I was able to get on my first paleontology expedition this summer. Woohoo! Uh, I, I was on. The dog managed to break in. <laughs> I tried to lock him out. He's in. All right. So, um, anyways, uh, she she was able to get on her first paleontology expedition. Uh, I was on a paleontology expedition last year, and it was uh, an incredible experience. I would very much like to be on another one. So uh, Lady Freedom Rocks also says $3 super sticker. And I think that, oh, here we go. Dolos Jangling, uh, $4.99. Can I, living in America, get the UK cover to your upcoming book too? Um, I think they're talking about your book this time. I think it's my book. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to ask you about that in just a moment. Um, I have no. Look at your dog. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I tried locking him out of the room, but he um, he he loves to be with me. <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up question at this point? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Liam. What about the similarities of L in Hebrew and Al in Arabic? Like Al in Arabic uh, is uh, Aleph also the first letter of the Arabic al alphabet. So like the God in Islam has titles too, like uh, Al Akbar, the greatest, right. you know, and like with uh, with L, there's El Shaddai, Elo Elohim. Uh, yeah, I mean, Al and Al, I mean, in terms of Allah in Arabic and Al um, in Hebrew, they, they both mean the same thing. They mean deity. Um, it's, it means deity, but can also be used as, as a, in, in an ancient world context, can be used as the proper name or the personal name of a god. Um, so, yeah, that, it, that's basically in terms of, you know, the commonalities between Arabic and, and Hebrew in terms of language. Um, but, yeah, like when it when you look at when you read the, the Bible and you see all these different names for God that are being used, like El Shaddai, for example, or El Elyon, um, there used to be a theory that these were all a different kind of a type of ale god, so that you had different sorts of this high god ale manifesting himself. Um, and that Yahweh kind of swallowed up these kinds of cult places and then titles of, of these deities. And, and, you know, to a certain extent, I'm still, I still quite like that theory. I think there's still something in it. But what's extraordinary is that when you read the book of Genesis, I mean, even the biblical writers themselves are open to the fact that, you know, their supposed ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, had, you know, they didn't worship the God Yahweh. They worshipped the God Ale. The name Israel Ale has Ale embedded in it. And um, you find a story in Genesis about Jacob setting up a cult place, which he names Ale, the God of Israel, not Yahweh, the God of Israel, Ale, the God of Israel. And that story about Moses at the burning bush, when like God's like, Moses, you know, your ancestors didn't know me by my name Yahweh. They knew me as El Shaddai. It's, it's, it's basically spin doctoring. It's kind of saying, oh, yeah, we know that there are two. These are basically two separate deities. But like this particular text is trying to to force the idea that they they are actually one and the same. Whereas whereas actually it looks like we've got different traditions about different types of deity going on that and Yahweh was originally distinct from El Shaddai or El. Um, um, did it have a polythe polytheistic origin do you think the Hebrew religion? Definitely absolutely and I think it remained polytheistic even in a, in a very reduced form it remained very polytheistic so by the time you get to the fifth century BCE so after the Babylonians have destroyed the Jerusalem temple a lot of the religious and political elites have been taken off into captivity in Babylonia. There, they really start to kind of reframe and reevaluate their religion. They realize all sorts of things about their religious practice, but it's that political catastrophe that kind of shatters traditional polytheistic religious practice in the regions that we would identify um, with ancient Israel and Judah. And even when you kind of get the, you know, Yahweh had been the patron deity, the head of this very small pantheon, up until then so even after that period he he retains his place as the as the patron deity his wife asherah is like kicked to the curb he gets rid of her but but you still have a lot of other divine beings within this pantheon they just get relegated it's like kind of they fall down the football league tables a bit so they were fully fledged kind of divine beings but then they gradually get relegated into the form of what we know as angels the word angel just means messenger it's a divine messenger that's what it means in hebrew and in greek and so you still gather plurality um, within ancient Israelite religion. And that plurality continues into the what we would call the earliest forms of Christianity, which were early forms of, of obviously early Judaism. Um, but the idea that there's only one divine being is very, very late in both Judaism and Christianity. It's very late. Um, I... we, see, we see that with a lot of other pantheons, too, like uh, uh, the Greek myths, they have uh, titans. And then, the, then there's the Greek gods that, yeah. that usurp them. Uh, but I, I think with uh, uh, the Hebrew religion, what you see is sometimes even demonization of uh, older gods like Baal, like uh, Belzebub. Uh, yeah, Baal. like his name is definitely kind of balderized. It's kind of he's bastardized, um, trying mm -hmm. to make him into, into something bad. But you see it with the Satan in the Book of Job. The Satan, it's a title, the Satan, the adversary or the accuser. He's basically God's justice minister. 
Um, but then he kind of gradually kind of gets literally demonized and vilified so that by the time you're into like the kind of the third to the second century BCE, he's already associated with this kind of a cosmic evil that's not a, not a servant of Yahweh anymore or one of his entourage, but is now kind of opposed to him. No. So yeah, I wonder if there was like some sort of political fight with among priests who followed uh, Satan and, and El or Yah Yahweh. But uh, with Asherah, uh, is this the reason why uh, some Christians, uh, besides the fact that it's pagan, won't bring a, tr a Christmas tree into their house because the Bible says uh, uh, don't don't uh, bring the trees in your house because that was, I think, a remnant of Asherah worship, wasn't it? Yeah, so the word Asherah in Hebrew um, is often hidden in English translation. So you get various regulations in the book of Deuteronomy. You know, it says you shall not plant a tree as an Asherah next to the altar of Yahweh, your God, which is the which is one reason why certain Christians will refuse to bring in Christmas trees, despite the fact that Christmas trees are nothing to do with Asherah. Um, but but the word Asherah is, is also the, her cult symbol, which seems to have been a stylized sacred tree. Um, took her name because you you didn't distinguish between the cult statue or the cult object and the deity. They were one and the same. Um, but quite often in English translations, that word Asherah is hidden. It will just say um, a sacred pole or something like that. So it's not a very accurate, you know, always beware when you're reading English translations that these are confessional um, and quite often primarily Christian confessional. And so are importing all sorts of bias into their translations. This leads into another question I had for you. I mean, I I, I read uh, bits of the uh, the Avestas of Zarathustra, and I realized that this is where the Satan character appears to come from. You know, that you have uh, uh, Araman the opposer, and the idea that you know that, that the righteous man upon his death will rise to the kingdom of justice and truth under the good Lord or the wise Lord, Ahura Mazda, but the um, the the vicious man. I think it was the word, uh, will descend into the kingdom of the lie ruled by Araman. And this character seems to be the template for the Satan character. And then what, what else I read was that uh, in Isaiah, when Isaiah is talking about, you know, how, how art thou fallen from the heavens, O Lucifer, he's not talking about any war of the angels and, and anybody being cast out. He's, he's making fun of Babylonian astrology, and specifically uh, criticizing the story about Halel ben Shahar being the you know the son of the dawn twin brother of the dusk yeah i mean that and there's two two interesting things to say about that i mean the first is yeah zoroastrianism particularly its real kind of cosmic dualism does seem to have played a role from the 5th century onwards in certain among certain jewish scribal communities in reshaping and recasting older traditions about this you know this accuser figure um and as i said he would have been just seen as one of you know not as necessarily as yahweh's right hand man but as his kind of justice minister as his interior minister he's like a kind of cosmic policeman like he kind of goes around walks across the earth making sure that people are doing what they should be doing so i think yeah the influence of zoroastrianism in the way in which the demonization of the satan figure and other demonic beings um how that particularly plays out in certain eschatological and apocalyptic Jewish groups, that certainly has a, an impact. And that Isaiah passage is really interesting because really that that uh, that reference to day, star, sun of dawn, that's just the best way that we can translate it. But it seems to be, that tradition seems to be kind of riffing off a mythic trope that we also find in Genesis and we also find in Ezekiel, which is about the primal human or who was cast as the king, the first king, ascending in ritually into the heavenly realm, but then being thrown out for misbehavior. So that's exactly what happens to Adam in the Garden of Eden. It's what happens to another king in the book of Ezekiel. And that Isaiah passage is riffing off a much older mythic trope whereby the king's privileged position and his relationship with the patron deities, um, he basically crosses the line. He's disobedient. He thinks that he is a god. You know, he is godlike, but he is not a god. And so as soon as he starts to think of himself as a god, then everyone in heaven gets pissed off and like throws him out. So, yeah, I think that's what's going on in those in those texts. But everything gets reworked and reinterpreted. And that's the thing about biblical texts is that these things were not written 
either to be history, nor were they written in a fixed form. So these texts were amended and redacted and had things inserted into them and were reworked and reinterpreted over not just generations, centuries and centuries. So that even by the time of Jesus, something like the Torah was not fixed. The Torah wasn't in a fixed form, like the Greek versions, the Septuagint, which were produced in about the third to the second centuries BCE, they show some marked differences from the, the Hebrew versions that we're familiar with. The Dead Sea Scrolls equally show us that, that you could have huge variation, not just in the books that we now, now know as canonical or biblical, but in, you know, they were producing their own version of, of what we would consider to be mosaic law. Um, the Temple Scroll is basically like a rewritten Torah, but it's all in the voice of God. So you're meant to, when you read this scroll, instead of saying, and Moses did this, and then and Moses said that Yahweh said such and such, it's Yahweh saying, and I tell you this, and I tell you that. And it's kind of pulling together bits of Leviticus and bits of Deuteronomy. But like when you're reading this scroll, you're meant to think this, this, the original version of this was written by Yahweh himself. I mean, man, that is like mega, mega big claim to be making. Um, but they were still making it in the first century BCE, which I love. So these texts were really fluid. They weren't stable collections at all. Just like the New Testament, uh, you know, in the New Testament, they reflect in themselves different versions of different jesus traditions like that was still very unstable i have more questions uh than we will have time for unfortunately <laughs> uh one one of the, i want to try to sneak in there is that i remember when i when i read the bible uh before i had read anybody else's interpretation of it i i, I remember recognizing a number of different things uh in the in the old testament and exodus especially where i said they're talking about a volcano here when it, when it says that they're following a column of smoke by day and a column of fire by night, that that's a volcano and a number of other different things. So that it, it seemed clear that Exodus is describing a volcano God. I mean, where is, where is this volcano if there is one? And am I on the right track there? Because it, it certainly looks like it. Um, well, I don't think you're on the right track. I think you're right to kind of to say, you know, this pillar of fire and pillar of cloud or it does seem volcanic and actually there's been some work some scholarship recently that suggests that volcanic imagery was applied to gods who are particularly associated with smelting um and craftsman gods which makes sense you know there was a lot of mining you know mining was a very important like for copper especially copper mines were really important in this southern levantine area in the ancient world so it's a possibility that yahweh I mean, as a storm god, he's particularly associated with mountains. They tend to be, because that's where you tend to get a lot of storms. Um, but, you know, equally, some there could be some um, kind of smelting imagery there. So in the sense of a volcano, I mean, it, it used to, scholars used to, and I'm talking about a particular kind of scholar here, particularly those that used to follow the Albright um, method of, biblical scholarship and archaeology, which was basically the Bible and spade approach. So take your Bible and then take a spade and basically try and dig up the places that you think the Bible refers to. And, and in that kind of vein, people used to say, oh, you know, we think there was a volcanic eruption on this island, you know, this Greek island or, you know, of this of this part of Italy. And could that have played a role? But that's to kind of misunderstand what the biblical texts are all about. There's no way that they want you to think this is volcanic because it's all about the cosmic power of Yahweh. This is not like, this is heavenly fire. This is heavenly cloud and smoke. It's not anything that earthly, that would exist in the earthly realm, if you see what I mean. So even though to us as kind of post enlightenment readers, we look at this and say, this really sounds like a volcano. That's not the way these ancient writers would have understood it. They they are really talking about a heavenly fire and, and, and a heavenly pillar of smoke and cloud. Um, on that note, I mean, I, I note that whenever it says that, you know, like only the spirit of God moved over the face of the waters and and I and and people being picked, you know, taken into heaven by a tornado or whatever. I mean, it, and dust devils, you know, suddenly appearing and blowing your blowing your stuff around and then disappearing in evanescence so that it so that they're actually devils. And of course, I'm talking more about the Quran here, but it, it just seems that that people understood clouds and wind and the breath of life if they didn't understand what air was and that seems to be where an all, all, the whole of this supernatural realm comes from it's interesting you should say that because in my new book um i i obviously i talk about i talk about god's anatomy and the way in which 
deities were conceived of was very much rooted in human bodily experience. And so, yeah, absolutely. Something like the breath of God. So the spirit of God hovering over the water in Genesis, it's Ruach, which is used for spirit, which is not the Trinitarian Christian kind of spirit. That's a much later invention. Um, but it's it's the breath, it's the exhalation of God. This was a God who breathed in and out. And we're told this all the way through a lot of these Hebrew Bible Old Testament texts. Um, but yeah, that, that idea of, I think some of it is rooted in the, you know, life is about that that intake that that feeling of breath that we get when we breathe in through our noses or our mouths that's what life is i mean you can see it in egyptian iconography that anchor sign is often held meaning life gods often hold that to mortals noses when mummy mummies are being transformed the mummification process is all about reconstituting the dead into a living being again and they have various amulets placed on their throats so yeah there is a lot of early religious the religious imagination in the ancient world um, and including around Yahweh um, is rooted in our own sense of what it is to what our own bodies do and the way in which God's body does something similar. So yeah, in that sense, you're right. So when we're, when we're kind of knocked off our feet by a strong wind and you know, when you're like, like the wind is really strong and it kind of suffocates you a little bit by going up into your nose and, and your mouth, it's that kind of sense of being taken over, possessed by a spirit. I think would have been a natural kind of assumption for some early, early Yahweh worshippers to have made. Uh, the last question I'm going to make sure to squeeze in here is on what, if any, historicity is there, or in the, in either Moses, the story of Moses, or the origin of Moses. Where do you see that that character coming from? <laughs> the short answer is there's no history in it whatsoever. <laughs> like I don't see it as. I, I very few critical, rigorous scholars in my field would say, yes, Moses definitely existed. It may be that Moses, the character of Moses, I mean, you've got, he's almost like four, four or five different characters. He's got different aspects to him of, you know, he's a law writer, he's a prophet, he's a magician, he's a royal figure. Um, even the the kind of the false etymology that's given of his name, you know, Moses to draw out, you know, that that's a, a that's the kind of trying to make sense of this kind of figure. So, yeah, I don't think he's historical. I think he's probably drawn on lots of different kind of folklore motifs. Um, a bit of Sinefru, a bit of Hammurabi. It's, yeah, basically stuff like I mean, obviously, like even, you know, being kind of set in in a basket of reeds and set off down, you know, onto the river waters. That's, you know, he's. He's recycling that, you know, we, we've got Mesopotamian sources that are much older that talk about the birth of a king being like that. So um, I think I think in that sense, we can't talk about the, the historicity of Moses. And then that means, well, was there an exodus? Well, no. I mean, I personally don't think there was at all. There's no archaeologically nothing stands up for it. Um, yeah, the point of that question was that I, I thought that 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 story had to be based maybe on on a different uh, a different period. I mean, I mean, some some people had thought that maybe it was based on their exile out of Babylon or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. So you need to look much later and say because outside of the Torah, so the first five books of the Bible, so um, you, it's incredible how little the Exodus is mentioned, how 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 infrequently it's mentioned in all these other texts. It's only really when these people's experience, these elites that were sent off to, you know, forced migration to Babylonia. It's only after that, in that period, when stories about the land was taken away, but we're going to be given the land again. This is our new homeland, this, this idea of coming into the land again. That's when the Exodus idea really kicks off, I think. And that's when that's when the, the traditions that we find in the first five, five books of the Bible are, are being written, basically. And so, yeah, it may be. I mean, people were in and out of Egypt all the time. Egypt as a river, you know, it's uh, the Nile was so important so that if you had famine in the southern Levant, it was an obvious thing to go down to Egypt because it's, it's a tidal climate there. Right. You know, the river rather than relying on rainfall. So people were always up and down into Egypt and um, people moved around a hell of a lot. I mean, look at our own world, political pressure population explosions, illnesses, whatever it is, you know, scarce resources means that people move. But there wasn't, you know, if people moved, perhaps the Exodus story is about a, a group who were in and out of Egypt, but much, much later. I mean, we know that 
the community in Jerusalem and nearby didn't just go to Babylonia. A lot of them migrated to Egypt anyway. And a lot of them had already migrated to Egypt. There's more money. If you want to make a good living for your family, you, you go where the, the money is, where the work is, where the trade routes are. Um, so maybe Exodus is based on folktale traditions, a bit of kind of um, some kind of skirmish at some bit of water, maybe. But it's also recycling a much older mythic trope of God's battle with a ferocious, raging, serpentine sea. Um, and you see that a lot in the in in the first five books of the Bible as well, the way that those traditions are being incorporated into this, this story of Exodus. So they're being historicized in order to give an identity to these diaspora communities who are wanting to come back to the promised land, the homeland. I could talk to you for such a long time, but that would be abusing both your time and the the people in the, gathered in the chat. So I'm going to get my wife. <laughs> one last follow-up question. Okay. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. Uh, human sacrifice with the Hebrews. Uh, yeah. There, you could see in the Bible uh, uh, the practice in in other people of the region, like uh, Moloch, the god Moloch, and uh, perhaps Baal. Uh, was circumcision uh, a replacement for human sacrifice by the Hebrews? Um, in my first book, which was um, the published version of my doctoral dissertation, I, I looked at child sacrifice. And um, I think there is a connection to be made, not historically, ideologically, ritually, between circumcision, male circumcision, infant circumcision and the sacrifice of firstborn animals just as you would sacrifice firstborn crops you doesn't something doesn't have to be living in order for in order for it to be sacrificed so you can so an offering of grain or oil is the same it's, it's still a sacrifice in that sense um and obviously there are regulations that say that you know where Yahweh says the first that opens the womb is mine seven days it shall be with its mother on the eighth day you shall give it to me but obviously in the bible those mythic ritual tropes are tempered with the condition that no, but you substitute something else for the firstborn human, quite absolutely rightly. So child sacrifice is a, I did write about it in my first book, as I said. Um, it's something I want to come back to all these years later, and I will do at some point. But I think there is an interesting mythological and ideological relationship between the two. Historically, we can't really know for sure. But we do know that some people did practice child sacrifice. Most most cultures at some point have practiced child sacrifice. Because um, Abraham, when he was about to sacrifice Isaac, uh, uh, God said no. And didn't he uh, circumcise him instead when he took him off the altar? No, that's in some later post-biblical traditions you get that. But in the, mm -hmm. in the Bible, first Abraham... Um, meets Yahweh and Yahweh says you need to sacrifice um you need to circumcise yourself and your household and then basically I'll give you fertility and then the next thing you know boom uh, along comes Isaac his firstborn son by means of his legal legitimate wife Sarah um and then God says now I want you to sacrifice your firstborn son to me so there's a lot of um these are mythological tropes that are being recycled and reworked for ideological purposes but yeah, later on, I mean, it's you get similar things in Greek myth as well about um, the Phoenicians told a myth about Kronos, who they identified with Ale, circumcising himself and then sacrificing his firstborn son. So it's it's not a unique thing um, in the Bible. It's quite a common mythic trope. Okay. Um, All right, we have some super chats. Um, did you have something else, Lalandra? Uh, no, but okay. we can proceed with the super chats. <laughs> All right, so we have another super sticker from Lady Freedom Rocks, uh, $3. And then we have uh, A Chaps for $2 super sticker. Thank you both uh, for that. And I don't know if we have more. I'm going to try to run through these. And up, oh, Dark Hunter gave another $20. Thank you very much. And next, uh, Peter Zydek, $5. Numbers 30, 17 to 18. Do modern Israelis on the extreme right wing use this folklore to justify their genocide against Palestinians today? I can't comment on modern Israeli extreme right wing um, politics with any authority at all. So I, I don't know. 
Okay. There's an awful lot in the Bible that can be used by Christian and um, Jewish people to support. You can pretty much support almost anything you want by interpreting the Bible. Notice my very cautionary bunny ear scare <laughs> um, and, and we've seen it done for centuries. But yeah, there are a lot of texts, both in the Hebrew Bible, um, Old Testament and the New Testament, that are really disturbing and that seem to promote mass killing of any kind of other person. Um, but yeah, there's, a, there's an awful lot of unpleasant stuff in the Bible. All right, Lalandra, I'm going to let you get to do the follow-up questions after I get through the super chat. So I'm skipping over some of those questions. If you look back over them, I've got a super chat from Spinosaurus, the proud socialist Egyptopithecus. Uh, what a great name. Uh, $5. Hey, Aaron, it looks like you can't call Kent Hovind inmate number 0645-2017 anymore. He will be getting a new cell number soon enough. Uh, super chat for Am Amiga Nuts. $10. Good show. Deserves to be supported. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Prophet of the Tardigrades. <laughs> There's another great name. 65 Mexican pesos. Question for Francesca. What do you think of Methuselah? Do you think he was a compound character like Jesus what, uh, or was entirely cloth made? Oh, is that an Americanism, cloth made? I don't know what that means. Does that mean like made up? It's the first time I've heard it, so I'm, oh, I'm guessing okay. maybe maybe it's a Mexican colloquialism. No, they're, they're, when you uh, make something up, uh, you uh, make, make it up out of whole, whole cloth. We would say it. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's an idiom. Well, oh, I see. Um, forgive my ignorance. I'm really sorry. Um, Methuselah, he, he's a really interesting character. I mean, I think he's drawn on, um, you find kind of similar sorts of characters in a lot of much, much, much older Mesopotamian traditions where, you know, human lifespans are, you know, ridiculous numbers of years, hundreds and hundreds of years. You get people like particularly kings, the Sumerian king list has all these kind of kings that live for like God knows how many years. Um, but Methuselah is really important because he plays a really important role in traditions that only really pop up you kind of get glimpses of them in the Bible. So like he's the longest lived man or whatever. Um, his dad is Enoch, who is the guy that's kind of walks with God for 300 years. And then God likes him so much that he takes him off up into the heavens to walk with him some more. Um, but by like the third, second century BCE and a lot of the Enoch traditions that we don't find in the Bible itself, but you kind of get little glimpses of in the Bible. Methuselah is really important because he's one of the the, the, the means by which when Enoch is taken up to heaven, God shows him his secret library of like everything that's that like all the kind of fates of the world have been written. And he shows Enoch this and Enoch kind of writes it all down and kind of copies all of these heavenly scrolls to make them into earthly scrolls and then gives them to Methuselah to like disperse in the in the earthly realm, which is a really interesting tradition because it suggests that actually God's teaching or knowledge or wisdom um, reaches the earthly realm long before Moses rocks up and goes up Mount Sinai and kind of delivers the Torah. So it's almost like a competing tradition about a sort of a secret hidden wisdom, heavenly wisdom compared to kind of the wisdom in the Torah. So, uh, yeah, I think he's a made up character in short. I could have just said that at the beginning, couldn't I? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have another super chat. The African Humanist for pound seventy nine says, I can't wait to get Francesca's book. And uh, at this at this moment is when I should probably ask you about that. Yeah, um, I'm very excited about this book. Like I've written, obviously, I've written a lot of academic books um, this far in my life. But academic books, they're very expensive. They're very scholarly and they tend to only to be read by about 10 other academics. Do you know what I mean? So um, <laughs> this is the first book. I've. This is my first book for non-specialist readers. But people are so interested in this stuff. I mean, that's why I do it. It's so bloody interesting. So, yeah, my book is called God and Anatomy, and it's basically a cultural history of, yeah, the origins of this God that we're kind of familiar with in the West. But, you know, talking about the God of the Bible and I track that cultural origin through his body, because originally people believed that everyone assumed that God had a human shaped body and that humans had God shaped bodies. That's what the tradition in Genesis is all about. Um so, yeah, I traced his body from his feet all the way through his legs to his genitals. Four huge chapters because um, he was very generously equipped. And, you know, through his tummy and his heart, um, 
arms and hands and his face and what he looked like and his breath and and basically trying to kind of track the biblical God. So through um, ancient Israelite religion to early Judaism to earliest Christianity um, and talk about what happened. How come this how come God was stripped of his body and why did that happen? So, yeah, it's coming out soon. It's coming out in the UK in September. Um, and for those of you that want the UK cover, I think you can order it on Amazon from the UK Amazon and you'll get like the UK cover. But it'll be out in the States in November. So I'm very excited. And it's got lots of nice pictures in it as well. Well, I'm going to be in the UK in May. So I'm going to get a, an advance. No, wait, no, I'm sorry. You're talking about this November. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> wait until may until you come to the uk and get it <laughs> okay so uh then we have another one uh, the, the the chat is just going by really fast uh, on this show so super chat spinosaurus the proud socialist adipithecus ten dollars thank you again i read the bible and when you read the early old testament books it's clear that god wasn't originally meant to be the all-powerful all-knowing universe a uh, ruler of the universe that people think of him now yeah i would have to agree with that and then uh let's see this is just questions looking for super chat let's see mark allen five dollars is lucifer just a title and not meant to be the name for satan like people mm. claim in isaiah that's I a think. really interesting question yeah so like the name lucifer is seems to derive from the latin translation of both the hebrew and the greek first so like you kind of got the hebrew scriptures that were translated into greek that are then translated into latin and Basically, it's this idea of the day, day star, sun of dawn, or the bringer of light. Um, so it seems to be a title. It could be a divine epithet. It could be a royal epithet. But it seems to be associated with kind of astral deities of some sort. Um, but yeah, it's not associated with Satan until much, much later. So in early Judaism and, and early Christianity, that's when you start getting all these different kind of baddies in the Hebrew Bible, like the serpent in the Garden of Eden, like the Satan character, um, like this fallen day star, son of dawn, um, the Rephaim, the Nephilim, like all these kind of bad buzzwords, Belial, all kind of start to cluster around this particular embodiment of or invention of but demonic evil. I always had a problem with the Satan character, even since I was a little bitty kid. I remember being a, a small child and, and my mother telling me about Satan and I'm it, and I had to ask her, what is his motivation? I mean, <laughs> exactly. and, and, and what's so bad about Satan? I mean, okay, so if we if we interpret, which, which is obviously the wrong interpretation, if we imagine that the serpent of the garden was supposed to be Satan, which it clearly was not, that the Bible neither, not only does the Bible not say that, but it doesn't even allow that, if you, if you, you know, uh, interpret it correctly, uh, that, that, that that character is the only one in the story that didn't lie. Everybody else lied. Yeah. So the, the Lord of Lies allegedly never told a lie that I know of. What's the worst thing Satan ever did? He tried to reason with Jesus. And also, that's one of my favorite bits in the Gospels as well, because basically it's like... <laughs> It's like Jesus and Satan just quoting bits of scripture at each other, which I really like. They're trying to like outquote each other. Satan knows <laughs> his Bible better than Jesus does, um, which I which I really like. Um, but yeah, I think he gets a pretty bad press, to be honest. I have something to uh, the day star, the sun of the dawn. Uh, is this some sort of like Hebrew astrology for the planet Venus? How it you can mm. see it in the morning, and it never rises above the moon or the sun. And the, yeah. it's so bright in the morning and yeah, so some, it never overtakes it. Yeah, so some scholars have argued that um, the day star, son of dawn um, title that we find in that biblical text should be associated somehow with Venus because of her brightness. See, I'm calling her a her because of its brightness. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously at dawn and dusk, um, mm -hmm. which are really important liminal times. And it's also when, you know, Venus is at its brightest and everything. So yeah, and Venus was very closely associated with Ishtar in Mesopotamia or Inanna um, in, as a Sumerian name. And she was probably associated with Asherah as well. So, it, it you know, it kind of makes sense, I think. So it's not explicit, um, kind of, it's not an, an explicit kind of astral association, but it's kind of, it's implicit, I think. And uh, Lucifer's crime was trying to out, outshine god basically and that's, 
yeah that's a later interpretation that was often used and that was quite popular in a lot of early christian communities that that scholars tend to call gnostic these days they're kind of secret wisdom they were kind of all into that um yeah all right, I've got another super chat. Spinosaurus, the proud socialist, Egyptopithecus, ten dollars. Uh, can I ask why snakes always seem to be the bad guy in the Bible? Is it just because snakes were a pest for the Hebrews, or is it more? Is it more? Is there more to it than that? I think there's more to it, and they're not always the bad guy. So um, there's a story about Moses. Who, you know, it's a very famous story that like when all the Israelites are complaining in the desert about like the shit journey from Egypt to the promised land, they're like, the food is terrible. It's so we're having such a bad time. And so God gets really pissed off with them and sends serpents, poisonous serpents. And then they start to bite the people and die. And then God, Moses says, oh, no, what should I do? And God says, make a cult statue of this serpent and set it up on a pole. And whoever looks at it shall live. Now, that story seems to be trying to explain um, a story that we find in the book of Kings about King Hezekiah, who is said to have, you know, not just torn down the Asherah um, poles or trees, um, but he's also said to have like torn down the Nahushtan, which means a bronze serpent um, that Moses had made because people were making offerings to it. So a lot of scholars think that the serpent, there was a, a particular form of a, of a bronze or golden serpent that was used as probably in a cult of healing which was kind of you know quite common in the ancient event and so serpents were often associated with healing because they shed their skin they can regenerate themselves basically they can hold poison in their bodies without dying um in some ancient mesopotamian traditions they're associated with um the secrets of immortality so yeah so serpents aren't always the bad guys i mean often but not always but there's always usually some mythic trope around these kinds of serpentine figures. I would get, get back over here. <laughs> you said so earlier to forgive your ignorance, but but we're learning we're learning a lot from you. So forgive our ignorance. Oh no, it kind of is cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh another super chat. Thor, logic of the gods, five pounds. Very much nope, get over here. You know, I like right that here. a lot. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, uh, unfortunately, we, we have it. We have a guest right now, and she has a cat, and the dog is trying to meet the cat, and we're <laughs> trying very much for that not to happen. <laughs> okay, so the super chat, uh, Logic of the Gods, five, uh, five pounds. Very much looking forward to Professor Stavrikopoulou's forthcoming book. Her work should be required reading in every house of education. Oh, yeah, we. we yeah, we all wish that people could be a little bit better educated, especially here. And then, uh, let me see, Super Sticker, Archer, 1.99. I'm guessing at $1.99. Stay over here. Get get over here. Over here. Hey. <laughs> over here. Not where the cat sleeps. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> so right. professional, right? <laughs> I, I I had him locked out, and he pressed again. It was one of these large hooks that, that goes in the loop, the huge screw that went in the wall, and he pulled it out of the wall. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> you can see he's a bit on the bigger side. <laughs> okay, so uh, is uh, another super chat? What? Um, Morak Zajac. PLN 10. I I don't know what currency that is. PLN? I don't know. Uh, oh, it says I should have read the rest of the message. Hi from Poland. Okay, that made sense. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's all for the super chats. Honey, you want to take over with the uh, audience questions? Okay, here we go. Uh, Scott Duke, the Jewish temple at Elef Elephantine? Elephantine. Elephantine. <laughs> Showed lack of awareness of Jerusalem-centered worship as late as the fifth century BCE. What other temples and shrines to Yahweh were there? Oh, that's such a good question. Yeah, so we have um, letters between a community in Elephantini, which is an island on the Nile, right down the Nile, um, that was inhabited by all sorts of different mixed communities. Um, but there was a community of Yahweh worshippers from probably from Judah, or maybe some people say. Some were migrants from the northern kingdom of Israel. 
we basically had a temple to Yahweh there and not just Yahweh but to two kind of consort date like a consort goddess and another deity perhaps um but yeah it shows that this kind of emphasis in the bible that there's only one place to worship god and that's the jerusalem temple was was not the historical reality so there's that temple on elephantini at about the same time on mount gerizim in the west bank um there was another temple to yahweh it's the temple that we would that late you know the jewish writers would call the samaritan temple um, but yeah, that temple was in operation from at least the fifth century down to about the second century BCE. Um, and even within kind of the kingdom of Judah, we know that there was a temple to Yahweh um, in a fortress um, at a place called Arad on Judah's southern border in the eighth century BCE. Um, so, and it may be that, that, that a, a temple has been recently discovered at a place called Tel Motza as well. So there were all sorts of Yahweh temples. So this kind of centralized um, this emphasis on centralization of worship that we find in Deuteronomy, like one God in one place, worshiped by one people, is basically bollocks, historically. <laughs> yeah, there's our, there's our sound bite. It's basically it, bollocks. <laughs> it almost seems like uh, monotheism was uh, uh, Yahweh's priests went out, Yehovah's priests went out against the other worships like kind of like Akhenaten tried to replace the Egyptian other Egyptian pantheon with uh, uh, the or the sun god the Aten, yeah I mean there are some a lot of people have drawn similarities between what happened with Akhenaten and um, and what happens with other kinds of um, kings like King Josiah or King Hezekiah mm -hmm. I, I don't know if we can you know I don't think that it that Akhenaten's monotheism was imported into ancient Israelite culture. I don't think it's that simple or that easy, nor historical. But I do think what they do have in common is that politics played a big role, human politics, ritual politics. Um, so, yeah, I think what we seem to have is that a group of very powerful families that had, you know, there were elite families, a lot of, you know, descended from some priests, came back from diaspora in Babylonia during the Persian period, um, sort of 5th century BCE and basically said okay we're in charge now and we're going to do things differently around here um, so I do think it was political um, but, it's all, but it's always you know any scholar will tell you but it's really really complicated and it's always far more complicated than than we realize but but ultimately something like monotheism it's not just about theology it's about politics it's about territory it's about power yeah um, like what happened to Asherah worship yeah Even exactly mentioned, don't put those trees in your house yeah, I mean, exactly. So I think it's it's about trying to, if you think about the emergence of monotheism from polytheism, maybe we ought to think more, talk about it more in terms of firstly pantheon reduction, you know, alongside the prioritization of Yahweh in certain political, urban, high status contexts. Um, and then the notion that to, to kind of marking people out as somehow our God is, is different from your God. And these are the ways in which our God is different. Um, our God is increasingly intolerant. And that really reflects a very, very small community. So even though the Bible gives the impression that everybody, like, you know, everybody was kind of sent off into exile in Babylonia and then everybody came back. It's not like that. Only a few hundred people came back. I've noticed that that seems to be a trend with not only with the gods themselves, but with the religions based on them, that they're always based on on love and brotherhood and peace and charity until they get power. Yeah. Or until they don't have power. I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's kind of. Yeah. I mean, I. I gods are man made, human made things. Um, and so they reflect the best of us and the worst of us, I think. I got to read some more super chats. Arden King, five pounds. Hearing how these stories spread with supposed hidden knowledge sounds like modern day conspiracy theories. I would have to agree with that. Uh, George S. sent five euro. Did the idea of kosher food also directly come from the Hebrew Bible? And what prohibitions did it entail beyond forbidding the consumption of pork? Oh, that's a complicated question. The short answer is, yeah, there are various foods that are forbidden primarily i mean pork is is one of them um but all cultures have foods that are inedible culturally inedible um so you know there are certain things that some cultures will eat that other cultures won't and so it's exactly the same so the hebrew bible reflects um some food prohibitions that were 
quite common. So quite a lot of Southern Levantine peoples didn't eat pork, whereas some did. Um, but the, the other kinds of food prohibitions include things like um, not eating certain kinds of shellfish, for example. Um, and we don't know, we can try anthropologically, you can try and guess at some of these reasons why certain foods are prohibited. So like with the pig, it's not because pork is considered to be more um, prone to bacteria. That's a very modern Western way of thinking about these things. It's because the pig exhibited all sorts of unsettling characteristics. It had the cunning of a human. It had, you know, the habits of a dirt dweller. It would eat anything. It had, you know, it didn't have the right kind of feet, it, it, all that kind of stuff. So it's a combination of characteristics that make it culturally inedible. And some Southern Levantine peoples um, associated the pig with the underworld. And so, you know, you shouldn't, you could only eat pork if it was, if you were having a meal with your dead ancestors, but you couldn't eat pork if you were having a meal with your local regional deities or with Yahweh. So it's, it's those kinds of contexts that make the difference quite often about about food laws. I like I like how people quote the Bible to say that, you know, that, that that homosexuality is a sin, but it's okay to eat pork and it's okay to have tattoos and it's yeah. and it's okay to eat shellfish because I like shrimp scampi. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, and, and this yeah. part of this part of Leviticus uh, is is God's eternal word, except that Jesus came to fulfill that so it, it doesn't no longer applies except the homosexuality thing is still a sin yeah. and we can we can forget that it says anything about uh, slavery because that was that was something different somehow don't ask me i don't i don't know exactly there's a there's a real pick and mix approach to um to bible interpretation um which i find very difficult often. another super chat el al aza let me try this again al uza akbar five dollars I can't wait for Francesca's book either. I've watched a number of her TV appearances. She's so smart. Oh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Super chat. Uh, Lemmy Bukalian. I would need practice with some of these names. Uh, six, six euros, 66. Never give up, Aaron. The factual world needs you. And then something that appears to be, I don't know what, like Greek? I don't know what, what language that is. And then uh, let's see another super chat. J form five pounds. Can the professor comment on speaking in tongues? I just want to hear her say <laughs> she came on a Honda <laughs> very fast three times. <laughs> that is honestly, that's not the first person that's told me that because I have a friend who's ex evangelical and she said that the best way she could kind of get through pretending that she was speaking in tongues was obviously to say she came on a Honda. Three times she came on Honda. Yeah. Um, speaking in tongues is a weird thing. There's this very strange um, chapter in the book of Acts where, after Jesus has been resurrected and taken up, he's gone off on his cloud escalator to heaven for, you know, never to be seen again. And all the disciples are in this house. And then suddenly, this kind of, again, this, this exhalation, this wind, this divine wind of God comes in and with tongues of fire, and they all start speaking foreign languages. So that's the thing. It's like speaking foreign languages. So it's not like that they're speaking like a cosmic language. They seem to be speaking, you know, Persian and, and Greek and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, in the hands of some modern Christians, that becomes a mystical. It, there, there's more of an emphasis on the mystical nature of the language. Uh, we've got super chats just flying in here. Dark Raptor 86 gave 20 euro. Thank you very much for that. How far is the progression with finding the missing books slash pages that are mentioned in the Bible? I know that Aaron has talked sometimes about them. The missing books are like, um, so you get references to, this is all written in the annals of the Kings of Judah, or this is written in the book of Jaha or whatever. Um, the wars yeah, of the Lord and so forth. Yeah, exactly. No, there's, there's no scholars recognize these as being some scholars think that they're that the books of kings and the books of chronicles were based were using very loosely some annals but annals were literally lists of kings like so and so was a king this was his name this was his mother's name he reigned for this many years then he died his successor was so and so so those probably something like that probably did exist um but yeah we're not gonna i don't think any serious scholar is on the hunt for them what scholars are more interested in at the moment is finding all the missing bits of all the fake Dead Sea Scrolls <laughs> that people used to think were real. So a lot of Dead Sea Scrolls are genuine and authentic, but um, there's a brilliant market in forgery, and there has been for a very long time when it comes to biblical antiquities. Um, 
And all of a sudden you find that bits of scroll that are supposed to be genuine turn out to be fake and then they go missing from various archives and museums. Um, yeah, that's what kind of worries scholars more at the moment, I think. Got another super chat, uh, Dark Raptor, 86, 20 pounds. No, I've got read that one. And then I've just got something that uh, apparently that is Greek, but I can't read the name because it's all Greek to me. And then it's uh, five euros, thank you, and followed by the, the title Pita Euros, Worth to Sin. Not sure I understand that. Greetings from Athens, Greece. Yay! Uh, and... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Lalandra, can you uh, pick up with the other questions? Okay. I wonder, this is from Tom M. I wonder if Dr. Stav could tell us if the Greek Orthodox Bible is closer to the original sources as opposed to the KJV. Also, oh. can she lay out the differences? Thanks. Yeah, so the, the, the KJV is the King James Version of the Bible that was produced um, in the United Kingdom in... Uh, 16 or something I forget the exact date that's very bad of me um so that's an English translation of um primarily the Latin primarily the Latin the Latin West's version of the scriptures so in the Greek East and the Latin West even the order of the books is sometimes different particularly in the Old Testament what counts as Old Testament like in a Protestant tradition is very different from what counts as Old Testament in a Roman Catholic tradition and equally in the Greek Orthodox tradition, what counts as biblical and those texts are different from what you might find in the Coptic tradition. Um, so yeah, as what, what was the question? It was, what's, I can't remember the question. What's the difference? What is it one more reliable than the other? Um, uh, just a sec. Or is the Greek Orthodox closer uh, to the original? Yeah, the Greek Orthodox, was it closer to the original? Um, not not the short answer is no it's not closer in the sense that both traditions canonical traditions have been through an awful lot of um uh change and curating and decision making i mean in the sense that you know even the greek that that greek orthodox if you open a greek orthodox bible today obviously the order of the books is different as i said quite often um so the, even modern Greek is very different. The way that we read, if you literally open a Greek Orthodox Bible, the modern Greek there is quite different from the kind of Greek that New Testament writers were using. So yeah, they're both, every translation is more than, it's not a direct translation. Every translation is an interpretation. It necessarily is. Um, so yeah, in terms of the different sorts of canonical traditions that we have, whether Protestant, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, um, they're all quite different and they all have a different kind of tradition of interpretation behind them. So yeah, learn Hebrew and, and Coptic Greek and, and uh, Koine Greek. And that's a much better way to get, to read the text in their original languages. Does the Gnostic Bible precede those? The Gnostic Bible, well, that's a weird collection. I mean, there is no kind of Gnostic Bible in that sense, but Gnostic Dead sea Scrolls text and the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of them are Aramaic. Some of them are Hebrew. Um, yeah, so I think learning, if you can, like learning the original languages is great because then you're faced with the decision that all translators are faced with, which is how do I interpret this? And you, it's not just like a word for word substitution. It's like, what do I think the context of this is? Well, wait, there's no punctuation. We're used to punctuation. There's no punctuation in this. So for example, in the New Testament, the word pneuma, meaning spirit, is usually capitalized. Spirit, like it's a a personification or divine personification um but there's quite often there's no definite article there's no the in front of the, the word in the greek there's definitely no capitalization in that sense there's no punctuation so how so do you render it as spirit or do you render it as breath or wind or you know a spirit with a small s i mean it's all about your interpretive choices so yeah it's a, it's a hard thing it's a hard thing um, okay, next question. Leo McMahon, uh, what's the earliest deity we know on record? <gasps> on record. Now oh, we're going Hindu now, right? I don't know. I mean, because some of the Sumerian stuff, I mean, we've got very early, in terms of on record, we have written down references to Enanna, 
the Sumerian goddess in her temple from about 3200 BCE. That really? literally just say Inanna and temple, yeah. But yeah, so that is, I would say that's probably, and that's proto cuneiform text. So before full blown cuneiform kicks off. Um, but that's what it looks like. It looks like Inanna and temple. So Wait, yeah. Did the pantheons maybe break off from each other from the Indo-European religion? There was that, that region. Yeah, the relationship between the regions like that is really interesting because a lot of anthropologists and sort of philologists put a lot of emphasis on the relationships between Indo-European um, family networks and sort of Semitic family kinship networks of religious ideas and cultures and languages. I don't know how much we can really know, to be honest. I've never found something that completely blows me away and makes me think, oh, yeah, this explains everything. But it <laughs> is interesting. They're like, there are really interesting. I mean, it's interesting when you look at some East Asian religions, there are some striking similarities with what we've got going on in Southwest Asian religions and then in Eastern Mediterranean religions. Um, but equally, you can find some of those mythic tropes in indigenous American traditions. And so it's kind of like, well at what point do you start saying well these are similar rather than that these are related it's it's quite hard to know what that like difference the, is. the the legend of the goddess the naga goddess nuqua uh creating men and women out of clay figurines and then also uh i, I don't think she, i don't think she caused the flood but she she ended the flood somebody else a human a, a human in a fit of rage accidentally caused the yeah. flood by, by tearing a hole in the firmament <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Which, yeah, and that exactly. And so, I mean, there used to be there was a there was a school of scholarship, of Scandinavian scholarship that was known as the Myth and Ritual School, and they were really into this. They looked at Nordic myths, and kind of Germanic myths, and you know, and East Asian myths, all all over the place. And kind of said there are basic, there are these kind of five or six basic motifs that you find in all human cultures, and the you know, it's about a flood, it's about the clay creation of humans. Um, it's about sex between deities, like, you know, heterosexual sex between deities. And there's usually a god, um, a male deity procreating by himself. Um, so, yeah, maybe it is something about being human, as I said. Like, you know, gods are, are made by humans. It's, you know, we're not made by gods. And so maybe there is something, maybe we're wired in a certain kind of way for our imaginations to kind of project these things in a certain way. I don't know. We uh, apparently overlooked a super chat. Balthazar228 gave $9.99. I always find it in so interesting to learn the truth behind many of the ancient myths. Thank you for your work on the Hovind, Hovind 19 vaccine. <laughs> that, that's uh, that, that, that's uh, it, it, somebody that I've been debating with here in the States. You, I, I hope you have not heard of him. A creationist. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, more, Lalandra, because we, we're going to have okay. to close it up. We've only got maximum 20 minutes, so we've got okay. to. Z Zagros Ozken asked, Superman's name, Kalel, always intrigued me and gave me an impression of Hebrew or Arabic name, and Superman himself has that Messiah vibe, as <laughs> for, has Professor Stavra Kapulu. Uh, I, I murdered it. <laughs> Uh, ever seen <laughs> such a connection? Um, so the question, yeah, Superman, like, yeah, a blatant messiah syndrome thing going on there, like with a lot of superheroes as well. Um, and also Spider Man, you know, one of the more recent Spider Mans, because I'm very old, but like one of the more recent ones when he's stopping a train, um, and he kind of spins out his spidey webs and he's almost like crucified on the front of this train as he's trying to stop it. So, yeah, there's a in you, you find that in the superhero. Western superhero trope. And a lot of scholars in fields related to mine have done an awful lot of work on looking at the ways in which particularly biblical myths and tropes are picked up and recycled in our own modern kind of Western superhero sagas. Um, so you should definitely look out for some work on that. Just Google the Bible in, you know, Hollywood or the Bible in Marvel movies and stuff, and you'll find loads of brilliant stuff there. I've never really thought about Superman's name. I can't remember what his name is. What is his name? Kal-El. Kal-El, Kal yeah. I've so never it, 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 And it seemed that the, the latter, it's it's hyphenated, so it's Cal-L. 
Oh, that would that, because in God, you would immediately think all oh, God, if it were if it were like a Hebrew, all oh, God. Yeah. 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 And then we also see like it, especially in Marvel and such, we see an awful lot of sacrifice. You know, where the, where the, where the yeah. heroes sacrifice themselves. And we have another uh, super sticker from Doubting Thomas for $20. And uh, Lalandri, the next questions, please. Okay. And like on that last question, I think one of the later Superman movies uh, had a, a Christian uh, a booklet that, that some, uh, some one of the sects uh, wanted uh, people to read to interpret Superman and that movie that way. Yeah, in a, in a Christian way. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, Anna uh, Aronal, uh always misspell Israel until I looked at it. Is Ra L? Is Ra is Ra God? Lo Lol probably doesn't connect to Ra God, but it helped. <laughs> yeah. What does Ra mean in in? Israel, I guess she's. Well, we don't know. That's the thing. So we know that scholars agree that the ale bit on the end of Israel means either ale, the name of a god ale, or it simply means deity or god. I then interpreted Israel. that as a question of am I God? What, Israel? It is Ra El. Oh, so I see. I'm Ra. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but we, in terms of the Hebrew Bible, we don't, the, you know, scholars are still very much undecided about what it, what Israel actually means, whether it means God strove or kind of, I don't know, all sorts of, we don't know. We have no idea. No idea what it means because, because ancient, in ancient Hebrew, it was a bit like um, modern Hebrew in the sense that there are no vowels. So it's contextless in, in some ways. Um, so you don't really know, unless you know how to pronounce it. You're not entirely sure. You know, you know roughly what the stem or the root of the word means, but you don't know what how it's functioning. So that's why um, we don't really know how the name Yahweh was pronounced, and equally, we don't really know what the name Israel means. Okay, uh, I think I understand this next question, and I don't know if this is our friend Bogey or not, but Bogey Bogla, oh dear, Bogla uh any plans for making a comparative study including the quran so i guess comparing the quran to the bible um the quran is very modern for me so basically like because islam didn't emerge until several centuries after the emergence of judaism and christianity it's it's a bit too modern for me and i'm not a i'm not an islam specialist um i'd like to be at some point um mm -hmm. but so maybe one day um but yeah, at the moment, I stick to my good old fashioned stuff for the time being. There's two more super languages. So. Two, two more super stickers. Doubting Thomas, $20. Thank you very much. And Bad Uncle Bob for £4.49. Thank you. Okay, ready for the next question? Yep. Uh, Atheist Junior, can I ask Francesca if she thinks Jesus existed, died, mm. and resurrected? What are, are her thoughts on the story of Jesus? Um, I don't think Jesus resurrected at all. Um, I think he died because I think he lived 2,000 years ago. So anyone that lived 2,000 years ago is dead. Um, I think some guy probably, I mean, who knows, a figure of some sort. Jesus of Nazareth, let's call him, existed. I think he was executed. I think his body was then thrown into a mass grave, which is what normally happened to the corpses of executed um, lower class people. Um, and I think that what happened after his death is that some of his followers thought they saw him. Now, some of those followers thought what they saw was his shade up from the underworld, whereas others thought that he had resurrected from the dead. Um, the same thing was said of John the Baptist. So it wasn't a kind of an unusual claim to make. Importantly, yeah. they didn't recognize him. Yeah, exactly. He, sho he shows up as other people. It somehow God, it, it, somehow Jesus has disguised himself yeah. so that his, his friends and his own mother yeah. don't recognize him. Exactly. I think the very fact that some people think that they saw him, but then a lot of the resurrection traditions do turn on this, on him not being recognized. His own followers don't recognize him. So... I think he probably existed. I think he was executed. And as I say, I think he was buried in a mass grave. Um, and then I think that was the end of him. Um, I but... think it, 
I think that they were probably more than one Jesus. I think if we had a time machine, we would find probably the the the, the one character that most of the legend is based on didn't have the demise that we thought he should, or that it or that some of those things were actually being done by a different person. So that, and I certainly think that if you if you were to take Jesus through a TARDIS to the modern day and show him something like you know the uh, Mel Gibson movie or or Jesus Christ Superstar or whatever, he would not recognize that this story is about him. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, yeah, I mean, some some scholars have argued that the Jesus traditions that we have are based on lots of different sorts of um, important holy men figures um, that were around. I mean, there were lots of there were all sorts of of messiah figures that were like wandering around at this time um and quite a lot of them did end up dead um a lot of them performed the kinds of miracles you know that that jesus is said to perform so there's nothing inherently unique about this collection of traditions that we have what makes them unique is that all of these other dudes they no longer kind of exist in our own kind of culture whereas christianity just took off and it took over the roman empire eventually um, and that's, you know, and that's what's more interesting to me is like, why, why that particular cult? Why that, why that early Jewish sect and not another early Jewish sect? You know, why not the cult of John the Baptist or, you know, the cult of Elijah or, you know, what, what was it about that particular cult that was so um, provocative and so attractive to, to all sorts of different people, not just Jewish people, but to Gentiles. And that's, I think, is the more interesting story. Um, what were the social and political and economic conditions that combined somehow to make this a really attractive story? Such that Constantine would, I think it was Constantine that appropriated yeah, yeah. and turned in and completely changes the whole thing. So that Yeah, I mean, people not, often talk about Constantine as like converting to Christianity. He didn't convert. He didn't completely stop worshipping all his normal deities. Like, you know, but he just also became a Christ worshipper. But making Christianity, I mean, the, the official religion... And again, notice my cautionary bunny ear quotation marks, the official religion of the Roman Empire um, towards the end of like the fourth century. I mean, that was that was a huge deal. I mean, he had good political and economic reasons for doing that. But also, you know, there was something in this story that appealed to him. Um, so, yeah, that's that's to me is more interesting. It's like, wow, that was mega successful. I mean, and Christians, like, Christians often comment that their, their religion was once upon a time illegal in the Roman Empire. And then I have to point out that, yeah, theirs was one of the few, uh, if the only religion that was illegal in Rome at one point. But then once they became dominant, it became illegal to be anything else. Exactly. And also they weren't the only ones persecuted. Jewish people were being persecuted. You know, Zoroastrians were being persecuted. Like, you know, there were all sorts of, and it wasn't, you weren't just persecuted. You weren't persecuted for your religious beliefs. You were persecuted for not being civilized. So in other words, if you refuse to sacrifice to the gods of Rome, for example, that is uncivilized behavior. That's why you you, you get targeted. Um, so yeah, that they, they were not the only people to suffer forms of persecution. And they certainly, uh, a lot of Christians in the West um, sort of use this rhetoric of persecution about themselves, um, that they're not being persecuted. I mean, persecution we see of some Christians, but they tend to be not in the West. Some Christians in the world are persecuted, but they don't live in America or the United Kingdom. We got another super chat, and then we're going to have to wrap it up because uh, I know that you're, your, your time is drawing short. So Spinosaurus, the proud socialist age of Dipithecus. Five dollars. What if all this time Jesus was like Brian from Monty Python? I'm pretty sure Monty Python was a lot closer than Mel Gibson. <laughs> I like. I mean, and I show I show my students um, the Monty Python film because there is some of it that I mean, even though it's all very tongue in cheek, actually historically it, it's spot on the money with some things. It's it's far more reliable than the Mel Gibson's Passion film. All right, so uh, Lalandra, any other questions to close up? Uh, there are, uh, like, so I, I guess I'm, I'm scrolling through them to see to pick which one uh, is to is the best. Drum roll, um, <laughs> Jeopardy music. <laughs> uh, Professor, it, it really has been a pleasure to have you on. I could talk to you for a long, long time. You're, you, you're right about you know, when you said that it's, that it's very, very interesting. 
I've been interested in the in the origin of religions and comparative mythology for the longest time. And so I, I find all of this fascinating. I've watched so many of your of your presentations. One question I'd like to ask you while she's scrolling through for the best one. Uh, you, you said a couple of times that some atheists were misrepresenting uh, religion in our activism. Uh, take a moment to address that. Yeah, I think what I meant by that was, um, particularly in the UK, but somebody like Richard Dawkins, he was, he tended, I mean, he's gone a bit quiet these days, um, but he tended to characterise religious people as stupid and ignorant. Um, and I think we need to be very careful with language like that. I mean, I'm an atheist. I always have been. I always will be. Um, but I don't, I recognise that there are lots of different ways of being in the world. And just because I'm an atheist doesn't mean to say that I I think of myself as a better person than somebody who is a Christian or who is Jewish or who is Muslim. Um, so I don't like some of that language that's used around, um, that's used to, to attack religious people i mean i don't agree with them um i think i think the world makes complete and perfect sense without positing the need for a god or gods um but yeah i think it's that language of of, of, of pitching people as stupid that i find really problematic um there are lots of different ways of being in the world there's this really interesting community that live in the amazon i was reading about not long ago who um, define what it is to be a person in relation to what that person is doing or is engaging with. So um, they are a person when they are in the presence of, say, a bush pig. Um, but when they are in the presence of a jaguar, they are no longer a person. The jaguar is a person. And so there are lots of, you know, so they're kind of, uh, their identity is shifting according to their perceived role, status, power, context, whatever it is. And I always like to keep that in mind to remind me that there are lots of different ways of being in the world. Um, and my way is my preferred way, but it doesn't mean to say it's the only right way of being in the world. So I think that's what I say when I kind of, I'd like to encourage my fellow atheists just to be a little bit kinder. I mean, obviously I don't agree with religious people, but, um, but you know, they share my interest, which, which you know, which I like. <laughs> We have some people asking where they can find you. Oh, um, you can find me on Twitter. I am at Prof Francesca on Twitter. And that's where I kind of hang out. I, I can't cope with Instagram. Um, and I can't really cope with um, my Facebook is basically for all my Greek family. So that gets complicated. So that's very private. So you can find me on Twitter. Yes. Okay. And Lalandra, what do you got? Okay. Uh, what does the Old Testament mean by let us create man in our image? Who was the us? That is the divine council. So that's God, Yahweh, talking to his other divine colleagues. So he was the head of, of the pantheon. But the, the biblical label for this kind of little, little small polytheistic group is the divine council. So when he says, let us create man or human in our image, male and female he created them that's because you've got male and female gods going on um so yeah that's basically humans have god-shaped bodies and gods have human-shaped bodies but that plural language you find it again in the tower of babel story too all right and, and i think that should probably be it and we can let you go uh, I want to thank you once again for being on. Thank you for my for, for my producer. Thank you for the audience. We've had uh, we've had quite a number of people. I think we had uh, 460, nearly 500 people watching this one. So thank you very much, everyone. And we'll go ahead and let you go. And uh, you, with your book, the book, the title that we're looking um, for. It's God's and Anatomy. God's Anatomy. God and okay. Anatomy. If you're up for that. That would uh, I do occasionally interview authors, and we can talk yeah. specifically about that uh, later on. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks to everyone for all their questions. Thank you for coming on. Bye. Bye. Bye.